Well, good afternoon. I'm uh, Bob Quillen. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, Vice President of Developer Relations for Oracle Cloud. And I'm going to walk you through um, the 12 days of DevOps. Let me get my slides up here. And uh, um, it's a really a, uh, a journey through um, almost a progression of the ghost of of DevOps past, present, and future, and where we're going as an industry. Uh, I also use the framework of uh, the 12 days of Christmas, the holiday carol. Um, hopefully some of you are familiar with that, but if not, it should uh, be themed around other subjects you're familiar with. And I'll walk you through that, and we'll kind of get started. So, um, you know, a lot of the work that we do at Oracle Cloud and around DevOps and is looking at like c culture, code, and cloud being kind of the core elements that are really driving us forward as a developer community. And it's changing you know, how we develop, especially the DevOps culture, changing how we develop on a day-to-day -day basis, how Dev works with ops, really change how we develop and, and the culture of IT itself. Uh, CNCF and open source technologies have really changed uh, the basis of what we develop with, almost democratizing open source and, open so and software itself, uh, where any developer, be it the hobbyist, uh, startup, to a large enterprise, can use what Google uses, can use what Netflix uses, can use what, how Uber scales its infrastructure. So all these elements have actually been put into Cloud Native Computing Foundation and the CNCF and really provide that open source foundation. And cloud really providing that, that infrastructure around compute, network, storage, and on up in managed services, which really gives you instant access to all these capabilities. So I'm going to walk you through this. This is the original 12 days of Christmas, you know, partridge in a pear tree, and we'll, we'll kind of uh, play on that theme as we go forward. So. Um, and if you're familiar with Buddy the Elf, I hope everyone's excited about DevOps as Buddy the Elf is excited about DevOps today. So we're going to jump into um, the first day of DevOps and talk about um, a container in a registry and just kind of where it all got started. Uh, we can thank Docker for a lot of that work as they were brought out to Docker and containers in 2013. Uh, Docker's gone through some changes lately, but if you think about starting in 2013, all they've done to build a standard model for uh, containers, uh, really creating a platform where we all got educated as developers is really what got Stack Engine, which was my startup. Uh, we started in Austin, Texas in 2014, focusing on enterprise container management. And so in this kind of evolution, this time frame, Docker came first, really built the foundation, uh, really built the developer community. Millions and millions of developers were educated and standardized around containers. Stack Engine, we were a small startup. We were acquired by Oracle in 2015, uh, which is about the same time Kubernetes came out with version 1.0. And now, here we are four years later and with the expansive element and stacks around cloud native, which we're going to walk through today. So, if we started with containers, it really provided the basis for looking at how do we move uh, enterprise applications and migrate them up to the cloud. Uh, you know, from a monolith, you know, a single light here to a, a set of microservices that could be managed to have web scale possibilities. And containers were really the start of that. So the second day of DevOps, we actually want to introduce microservices, with microservices providing that, that capability for taking a, you know, a monolithic set, you know, one service that had to be replicated one at a time into many, many services that are highly scalable. And, you know, from taking a single process to multiple processes, it created some, some challenges, and we'll walk through those as we go forward. But it allows us to have much more loose coupling, uh, the business processes are much more easily defined, and it can be parceled out to smaller teams and made it much easier to develop applications. So we have containers and microservices, which kind of then go hand in hand. You know, one you know, enables the other and sort of provided the basis. But they still ran on servers. So. You know, as George Bailey thinks about, you know, you know, wouldn't it be a wonderful life if there were no servers to manage? So we're going to introduce the idea of functions now. So we have containers, microservices, and now functions, a serverless capability. And with serverless, uh, a whole new set of functions as a service or FAST solutions were provided. Oracle has Oracle Functions, 
And as this new generation of, of serverless capabilities came out, there, a lot of them are based upon open source technologies. Oracle started the FN project, and I think there's a, a session coming up later in the conference around FN project. I would love you guys to go see that and learn more about open source and serverless, because there's a lot of proprietary solutions around serverless capabilities. But the idea that with functions as a service, you can now run functions, you can put them in a container, so we're building on that infrastructure, it can run on top of Kubernetes, and can provide a service that allows you to not have to deal with, with the servers themselves, if you don't want to. So in the developer toolbox, we've got microservices, we've got containers, we have a serverless capability. The next question then is, the, how do we manage all that? How do we orchestrate it? How do we scale it, start it, uh, scale out, scale up, scale down? So we bring in now Kubernetes. The plot thickens, although what we're doing now is migrating from a developer-centric approach to something that's much more DevOps and operational-centric, going to production. All the stuff we've been developing over those last few years are now going to production, and we're able to take a microservice architecture, run it through a CI-CD pipeline, stick the Im images in a registry, have our Kubernetes engine, our service pull that out, and now all the uh, cloud providers have managed services around Kubernetes. Oracle itself does too, the Oracle container engine for Kubernetes. We can deploy those to production and scale those out and manage those as appropriate. So now I have a way to operationalize and manage on a day-to-day -day basis and manage all the clusters and all the infrastructure underneath that from my containers, my applications, even throw some functions in there too. So making progress along our DevOps journey here. So on the fifth day of DevOps, we look at five APIs. Well, probably more APIs than that, but really containers and cloud native applications don't live in seclusion, in isolation. They need to be integrated. So API management becomes a real key thing around gluing these together. If I want to glue my Kubernetes applications with my functions, with my on-premise applications, or even SaaS applications, and have these integrated together with different business processes, I want an API gateway to do that. And API gateways provide a great way to integrate access control, rate limiting, and a variety of API control mechanisms where you can consolidate how you manage APIs. So, and that provides the glue. So it seems like it's still pretty simple. I got some basic functions, containers, microservices, I got Kubernetes, run it all, I can manage my APIs. And then things get a little complicated. So. You know, CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, uh, you know, and the vendors around that, and Oracle's a platinum member of CNCF, so we have a little bit to, to do with this, but also it's a, in an effort to create a taxonomy and organize what's going on in Cloud Native, really created a uh, testament to complexity. And this is where things got a little, little scary and hard to understand. I mean, you almost need an, it's an eye chart. You need a, a microscope to look at all these different solutions and figure out where they fit. And it became daunting for a lot of enterprises to figure out, how do I take what I have today and move that into the cloud and use all this stuff? So, so next ch challenge in DevOps was to start managing all this complexity and maybe curating it and finding a way to make it easier for enterprises to go from where they are today to the next level. So, yeah. so we're looking at, is there an easier way to manage DevOps and containers? So there's gotta be an easier way and someone needs to help. So enter the operator pattern, Kubernetes operator pattern and open service brokers. And these became great ways, and these are great ways, and they've kind of rolled out more so in the last two years than before as a way to help enterprise and existing applications integrate into a Kubernetes ecosystem. We open sourced a web logic operator for Kubernetes that allows you to run web logic applications on top of Kubernetes. CERN Lab is actually you know, based in Switzerland here in Europe, and they went from like a two week deployment or two day deployment cycle down to a two hour, down to two minutes by going to a CI CD cycle using a container application, but using their web logic on top of Kubernetes. So it gave them an on ramp into cloud native based on things they know. It simplified things. So there's a ton of operators out there. There's a MySQL operator that we've open source and, and many, many, many other operators out there that allow you to run your existing infrastructure on top of Kubernetes. So that's a not, kind of a cheat or a way to get onto cloud data much more quickly. 
Uh, the open service broker, which is another open standard, um, allows you to connect into other types of service and have a service catalog. One of the things we found was that uh, many customers were deploying an autonomous database. Oracle has a really strong autonomous database. Many database customers, as I'm sure you're all familiar with Oracle's history there. Um, and as they move to the cloud, they want to integrate into things like a Kubernetes application. But as containers go up and down, you want to have persistence. And persistence is an ongoing issue around containers. Well, the open service broker and the service broker applications allow you to then maintain that connection. Containers goes down, the service broker keeps the connection to the autonomous database going. So you can always connect back in. So as a, an alternative or an extension to the idea of persistent volumes, now you could have a database back there that's using that same capability or even a better capability with all the database goodness that comes with that. And if there's a bunch of stuff on GitHub, you can look up many blogs, many applications around that. So, so on the eighth day of DevOps, we're making our way through this. We have complexity. We're trying to figure out how do we learn all this stuff? How do we manage all these things ourselves? And you know, two, three years ago, you go to KubeCon or you go to a DockerCon, and everyone's talking about how they stood up Kubernetes or run, run Docker themselves. Now the transition is everyone, if possible, is going to run a managed service because all these things are taken care of for you. You don't have to scale it, deal with high availability, install it, keep up to date. There's a three-month release cycle in Kubernetes and no one wants to keep up with. So you don't want to become a Kubernetes expert and have to go up that learning curve and then build your own applications. Managed services, once again, are kind of a cheat or a way to leapfrog up the, uh, the learning curve and move forward much more quickly. So all these things like operators, brokers, managed services allow you to get on board cloud native much more qu quickly than you did two or three years ago. And the services are coming out more and more frequently now on a variety of other things as we move up stack. So if we ex keep extending to what else is going on, streaming, real-time architectures, uh, event-based and oriented architectures are really driving uh, application development and web application development around things like you know, financial services, fintech, uh, IoT, uh, smart devices, smart cars. All this data streaming in is being used in conjunction with cloud native technologies, database technologies. So these need to integrate also into the cloud native world, Kafka being the, the standard for that. And now all the cloud service providers have Kafka, Kafka services. Um, that can integrate with your Kubernetes applications, your database applications, your analytics applications. Oracle has a streaming service based upon Kafka now. Uh, we just announced the KubeCon last week or two weeks ago. So this provides a nice streaming event-oriented architecture um, that now gives us a basis to connect more things together and build a broader set of applications. So. One of the final things we always remember is that we need to monitor and log things. We got to look at observability. We got to make a list, check it twice, figure out what logs are, are naughty and nice, so to speak. So um, as we look at observability, logging is another area which has really um, become much more standardized with uh, FluentD, which is another CNCF graduated project basically providing a unified data collector and a unified layer of something that used to be very complex. I borrowed these from the FluentD site, thank you. Um, but once you go from something that's very complex, very proprietary, and we used to buy a lot of proprietary logging services and systems, FluentD actually has now helped people to standardize that in a much more cloud-native way, much more consistent way. Uh, logging services now support this. It's something that Oracle supports. It's a graduate project. It's a simple way to now standardize logging and observability to manage these things in a much more uh, optimal way. So, there's m many sessions this week on service mesh. And if, uh, you know, we were at KubeCon last couple weeks ago, and, you know, service mesh and, and and multi-cloud, which I'll talk about next, are really two of the, the biggest next themes that people are trying to traverse as they're looking at how to build an application and manage an application around uh, a service mesh. And what the service mesh actually provides a way is to create a separation of concerns between a data plane, which is where the application developers manage, and a control plane. And Istio itself creates a, you know, the data plane using Envoy proxies and sidecars, but also a control plane which manages all this infrastructure together. 
um, Linker D providing a full solution around that. And this is one of the areas I think that needs to be worked out eventually. Uh, we'll find over the next couple of years where this goes, Istio versus Linker D, different factions that are forming. But the idea of having a way to manage your application in a microservice application and separating the concerns between the data management and the DevOps management or the networking, uh, the security, uh, the isolation, the access control related to that. Um, another key aspect of what's going on in the industry. So, so we made our way sort of through those 11 days of DevOps. The, the 12th day, we're going to start focusing on multi-cloud. And there's a lot of work that's being done in multi-cloud. Uh, there's a lot of technology and tooling that's coming up, and it's kind of early in the maturity curve. It's possible to do now. Many people are starting to do it. Uh, one of the things that I think is a good example of where it's come is that Oracle and Microsoft have built an integration that's an interoperability that has a, a well-defined interconnect set of services for their multi-cloud, uh, a set of certified applications, uh, unified identity, uh, single sign-on, common set of partners, an ecosystem. So I think it's it, it, one of the first signs that multi-cloud is, is real when you have companies like Oracle and Microsoft integrating together, which is kind of no one expected and providing a way to make it enterprise level multi-cloud. This is a pairwise integration, which is a start. And it's going to eventually lead to a much more unified set of services and multi-cloud capabilities. And it kind of gets us all the way through. We've kind of looked at some of the simpler elements, the more basic elements of microservices, of containers, uh, all the way up through Kubernetes. Now, through service mesh up to multi-cloud. And it kind of creates a full spectrum of where we have been where we are and where we're going. And, and that kind of then wraps up my, my 12 days of DevOps. Um, and we started with a container and a registry and worked all the way up to 12 multi-clouds. I think I might have my, my holiday or Christmas card now available um, for the 12 days of DevOps. Um, but I, I encourage you all to uh, you know, check out the Oracle. We have a new free tier, always set of free services. So you, you log on to Oracle Cloud and take a look at that. Um, come by our booth, learn more about what we're doing. And uh, that's my walk through the 12 days of DevOps. And uh, wish you guys a happy holidays. And, and come on, meet us at the booth, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks.